And wow, uh, she got lines as well. Oh yeah, I had lines. Oh, it was great. Yeah, I had to inform this family that unfortunately their daughter was in a car accident, and I had her wallet and her sweater and her keys. And then I had to, uh, the grandmother overhears me behind and she collapses and I had to do a, <gasps> yeah, pretty good, right? Are you ready? All right. Hi there, I'm Nora Dunn, and I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and welcome to my series where I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary remote careers, travel lifestyles, and travel adventures. And let me tell you, the travel adventures that I'm going to be sharing with my guest today are insane. But before I introduce my guest, I would like to do a little bit of housekeeping, and that is, if you are not already subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe. Uh, I will thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you do like this video along the way, I'm always appreciating a thumbs up. Also in the description, you will find a link for a checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long-term. And this will get you set up for a long-term travel lifestyle, whether it be a few months or a few years. Now, my guest today is Derek Earl Barron, otherwise known as Wandering Earl. He left home in 1999, shortly after graduating from university, and his goal was a three-month trip around Southeast Asia. The thing is, three months later, he had only $1,500 to his name, but he wanted to keep going. And he is still going today. Derek has now traveled all over the world for 21 years. He's worked on cruise ships, he's written ebooks, he's successfully blogged since 2009. He started his own tour company that runs unique small group trips to some of his favorite countries. And he's also recently started an initiative for remote workers that I'm going to be talking about with him later. He's been featured by publications such as Time Magazine and the New York Times, and he's frequently invited to speak at events and on podcasts in order to share his stories, his travel insights, and his adventures from his life of travel. 21 years, Derek. Wow. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. Yeah, that's not something I would have, uh, I didn't imagine it would last this long. Let's put it that way. Well, you blow me out of the water because I traveled for 12 years straight full time and I thought that was really impressive. And then I met you. And... Hey, that's no joke. 12 years is no joke. <laughs> well, it, that's true. And so this begs the question, I, you know, I want to know, first of all, what was the what was the kind of driving decision for you to stay on the road and then for you to continue to stay on the road? And maybe you can give us an overview of what you did over those 21 years, because I know your style of travel changed dramatically over sure. those years. For sure. I mean, in the beginning, I just was, I, I thought it was cool. You know, I went to Angkor Wat in Cambodia for the millennium and I was there. It was, it was one of the most unbelievable experiences. And that was one week into my three month trip. And that pretty much triggered something where I was like, wow, this is something I never imagined I would participate in. And what if I, what if I extended this three month trip for a long time indefinitely, just think of all the things I would do during my life over the years. Again, I didn't really think it would last 21 years, but I thought maybe I could pull off a year or two. Let's see how this goes. Because back in 1999, there weren't too many people doing it um, or you couldn't go online and read about everybody doing it. So it was kind of just a, a wacky idea. And then it all started. I just kept on going. And, and as you mentioned, I started, I taught English. I worked on cruise ships. Um, after cruise ships, I started to, to blog and now the tour company. So pretty much the one thing that stayed core for me is it was a very cool experience in the beginning where I was at Angkor Wat and seeing cool places, but then it quickly changed within a month of my, of my travels, you know, that first trip, I realized that for me, it was about the people, right? So I just found it fascinating that I was able to meet people on my travels that I would never come across in my life if I didn't travel. And that concept kind of kept me through and that kept me going and, and kept me motivated to try and find more ways to, to stay on the road. And, um, pretty much to see what I could do. And again, it just somehow kept, kept going. And I think one of the reasons why it lasted that long is because I also stop every now and then and sort of look within and try to figure out, okay, this is the path I'm headed right now. How do I feel about it? Is there something else I want to do? And I make sure that I am adjusting my travels accordingly. So it's not like I just grab my backpack and have literally every day been on the move for 21 years. If I need to stay in one place, I'll find a place to stay for a few months to just re-energize. If I want to suddenly go see a ton of countries in a, in a in a year, I'll bounce around super fast. If I want to, you know, whatever I feel like I need, 
that's what I'll do. And that sort of has allowed me to stay on the road, I think, longer because I'm constantly adjusting based on what I need at any given time. There's so much stuff I want to unpack there. Unpack there, it's insane. Uh, but that's good life advice, really. I mean, taking stock of where you're at at any stage of the game and making sure that your trajectory is where you want to go. I think it's fabulous life advice and lifestyle design oh. advice. One thing that you said, you talked about meeting people and that really being uh, an important element to your uh, your curiosity to continue to travel. Now. I traveled full time for 12 years. I've interviewed a few other people on this series who have traveled anywhere from nine to 11 years. Mm -hmm. And we all cited, we all basically decided to hang up our, our, our full time travel monikers uh, in and around that nine to 12 year period. And one of the reasons we, we felt we needed to get a home base was because we found that although we were meeting a lot of people, the depth of those relationships sometimes left something to be desired. And I'm curious what your experiences have been along the way. Totally. I mean, I think two things. So yes, to, a, to an extent, that's true. Um, at the same time, I think the world is becoming so small where it's not that absurd if I'm in Lisbon, Portugal, and I want to go hang out with my friends who are in Bali. It's, it's actually very, or at least pre-pandemic times, it's so much more accessible, the world now, that you can actually do that. And I do come back to the U.S. four or five times a year, pop in for a few weeks, see my friends and family, and spend time. So I just feel like it's become much easier now to keep up those connections. And also to be perfectly honest, it's not the case with everybody, but a lot of my long-term traveler friends that did get a home base have now given that home base up because basically it, they didn't make that community. Cause it's also very difficult after being away for a long time to just show up somewhere and be like, let's go, I'm ready for deep connections. Unless you have a city or a town already where you have a bunch of people that you're still friends with. It's pretty hard after you've been gone for a while to to integrate and to suddenly make a really close, big group of friends when you're 40 years old. It's very difficult. Uh, so I found a lot of my friends went home trying to find that, didn't, and they hit the road again. Um, or they've done things like move to Playa del Carmen, Mexico, stay here for six months of the year and live in Lisbon for six months of the year. Or they, so they have sort of these mini bases. And with that, you're able to, to maintain the connections a lot better than you could say 10 years ago, um, it's it's just much easier. And, and I, I think that's definitely helped. Now you mentioned two of the digital nomad hubs of the world, of course, being Playa del Carmen and Lisbon, uh, other places are Medellin and Chiang Mai. Uh, and these are great places for digital nomads and remote workers who are constantly on the go to, to stay for a while, generally take advantage of a lower cost of living and also to network and deepen friendships with other people with similar lifestyles. Exactly. How have you uh, developed, or have you developed relationships with locals along the way as well? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think it depends on different, uh, it's how you approach it, right? You could very easily go to, you could very easily come to Playa del Carmen and 100% only go to meetups and groups that are 100% foreigners and, and that's it. And you could almost go through your life here without interacting with locals apart, in, apart from in businesses. Um, so I do think in some places it takes an effort. Um, it definitely takes an effort because it's obviously very easy to default to, you know, just a group of foreigners who are working online. Um, but I, it's, I don't know, I don't find it, maybe it's just because I've been traveling for a long time and before there was you know, all internet stuff where you had to actually talk to people, maybe that, that helps that I had that experience for a while. But I mean, I don't think it's that difficult. We just have to, um, a lot of people don't want to, but uh, for me, yeah, I still like to maintain that. So I do try to interact and that kind of dictates a lot of the places that I go for my personal travels these days too, is to, go to places where there's not much tourism, not much tourism infrastructure, where, I mean, you have no choice. And because I like the benefit of hearing the stories of people that generally would not have a voice or that you don't, you know, you don't hear much about. And, and that's why I do like to go to places that are a little more off the beaten path, just, just to, to see, because you don't hear about it much and, and it kind of gets forgotten. Well, and the reality is also within the digital nomad community, uh, it, it's an international thing. I actually read in your newsletter recently that you you were hanging out with people from eight different countries yeah. uh, and they all shared the similar lifestyle to you. So you all had that common bond, but there was still a, a definite mix of cultures and an intercultural exchange that was happening uh, by virtue of you all being in the same place. Absolutely. That's a great point, because I would say 10 years ago when this all started, it was pretty much if you met somebody working online, they're from one of a handful of countries. And now nobody's really surprised, no matter where somebody says they're from, when you meet them on the road and they've started, it doesn't matter. And 
it would be from countries where you ordinarily might not think that remote work has made it there so much, but it's possible. And, and, and I think that is the beauty of it now is that people are figuring it out in every corner of the world. And uh, as a result, you're right, that community of people is, is incredibly diverse, um, which is a huge, huge bonus. That also has me thinking about a different element of remote work and the, the opening of possibilities for people around the world. Uh, at one point, it was seen that digital nomads were simply people from uh, countries with high currencies, you know, people from North America and Europe, people who had privileged and well-to-do backgrounds and were taking advantage of, of things like currency arbitrage to live in places uh, where there's a lower cost of living. And yet now with remote work, uh, it, it's not out of the realm of reason for anybody around the world from any country in the world to take advantage of remote work and then to be able to travel with it. Because if you are providing a service, that service, there is almost a universal rate for that service that would be accepted. Uh, and then really at that stage of the game, the biggest obstacle, I guess, would be the strength of your passport and the ease of getting around uh, without having to constantly apply for visas. Totally, and that's exactly where the shift is because now that people realize that you can charge X amount and that's going to be accepted around the world so have cities the days of going to cheap destinations are almost over because basically people realize that if you're willing to pay a thousand dollars a month for rent in mexico you're willing to pay a thousand dollars a month for rent anywhere and if you're willing to pay four dollars for a coffee somewhere you're willing to pay four dollars for a coffee so i've found now in, in extensive research for my remote club project it's not that much different around the world now um, just because people realize it. And I've seen here in Mexico, just in the last three months, so many remote workers have come here that apartments that used to be $900 are going for 2,500 right now because they're coming from San Francisco where they paid 3,500. So that's the difference. And, and I think people are realizing this. So I don't find the, the currency thing is now sort of on its way out. I find that uh, everybody wants the same lifestyle wherever they go. Everybody wants the same cool cafes, they want the same, they want Thai food, regardless of what country they're in, they want, and all that kind of costs money. And as a result, every, it's kind of catching up to prices in, in you know, anywhere else. So I, I do find it kind of evening out around the world. So it is just the passport that seems to be the biggest, uh, you know, advantage. Wow, that is fascinating. And I was going to save this for later, but we're on track to it now. So uh, you you planted the seed, Remote Club. This is a project that you started last year, whilst grounded, uh, stuck in Bali, <laughs> proverbially speaking, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and this is a site that is uh, intended to serve remote workers. Talk a little bit about Remote Club, please. Sure. So a friend and I, uh, of mine and I, we basically came up with this idea to create a site that would help this new wave of remote workers who are trying to find somewhere else to go they have some freedom so maybe they want to go somewhere for a month maybe they want to go somewhere for a year maybe they want to go to a bunch of places overseas um, or even in the us but they haven't done it before so we're trying to provide all the specific information that would make their decision as easy as possible and then their adjustment to life in that destination as easy as possible as well in terms of things we've talked about um, especially finding a community of people to connect with places to work the easiest ways to find a, uh, an apartment or accommodation um, and then all the little details that you would want to know about everything from you know from the currency to the you know how to get a sim card just kind of all in one place where you can just say i'm going to i want to go to um you know valencia spain and boom everything do i want to i can you can compare that city with another city oh, maybe i want to go to istanbul you can look at the both the cost of living um, in both, you can look at all the details, decide on one, and then everything you need to get there, find a good neighborhood to, to live in, um, find good places to work, co-working spaces, cafes, and then find all the groups you need to, to connect with other people instantly so you don't really have to figure it out on your own. So we're trying to make that easy for people who aren't, as used to say, the digital nomads who've been bouncing around the world for many years. That's actually a pretty small segment of, of the people. And I think, you know, these re new remote workers, that's not what they've been doing. So you know, they don't have maybe that knowledge quite yet. So we're trying to sort of fill that gap and make it make their decisions easier and their overseas experience more more rewarding. 
I will say that is one of the uh, most tiresome elements for me of having been a digital nomad is, uh, and one, one of the factors that, that you don't understand until you get into it is the sheer amount of time and energy that is required mm -hmm. to choose a destination, research it from afar, figure out how to get there, get there, figure out the best neighborhood to be in, find a place to stay, figure out how to just live in that destination. And, you know, many people who uh, start out on this lifestyle think that, oh, if I spend one month in each location, that's a long time. And I mean, I find it, at one month of destination, by the time I figure out where to buy my milk, I have to start planning for my next destination. Okay. So okay. for me, it was always, uh, you know, I've always been a proponent of slow travel and, and staying, if you can, three months, even more than that sometimes oh. in a destination. Uh, but you really cut down that learning curve very quickly and help people get there quickly and, and, and integrate successfully, saving a huge amount of time. Yeah, that's the idea. That's the idea because it's super overwhelming, especially if you don't know. And, you know, most people don't, they don't need to know every detail about the place. It's like, so we're not trying to provide every single detail that you could possibly want to know. You know, it's like uh, SIM cards, for example. We're not listing every single possible SIM card that you can get from this company that, no, every, you just want to know what's a good one. I just want to get it. Where can I get it right when I arrive? Done. So we're trying to just cut out all the you know, extra information and say, this is all reliable stuff. This is how you can do it. This will get you started. And, and that's the key. Cause then a lot of stuff happens on their own, on its own, right? You meet people, it leads to other communities. Okay. We just want to help you get started, get situated without having to, you know, go through all that guesswork or spend a ton of time researching stuff that you're not even sure about in the first place, which just makes it even more frustrating. So one of the biggest costs of travel, uh, especially a full-time travel lifestyle, is accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, hands down, that's what you're going to spend the most amount of money on. And you mentioned earlier that the cost of accommodation is, is almost becoming a little equalized uh, around the world. Uh, I'm curious. So let's say, for example, I want to go to uh, Lisbon. Uh, how... Er how will Remote Club help me find a place to stay? Or will it help me find a place to stay? Or it, do you recommend specific places? So we don't re recommend specific apartments, um, but what we do is we've done all the research of every, uh, uh, all the agencies, all the websites, Facebook groups, you name it, where they are, are, you know, advertising apartments. And we basically have narrowed it down to a handful of ones that will cover all budgets, all neighborhoods, and have been considered reliable by digital nomad communities in these places. And basically, so you don't have to go spend and look on a hundred sites. These are the say five sites where go look, if you want to sub, if you want to have a roommate, you go and look in this Facebook group. These are just apartment owners who have extra rooms. If you want your own apartment kind of high end, this is the agency you contact. If you just want a standard good apartment, go through this website. So it's, we try to make it as simple as possible. So you have, and we have the descriptions of each site on, on remote club. So you don't have to click on all of them. If it's, One's not for you, don't click on it. So you can hopefully very quickly find the source that will be the best match for you. Um, and, and you can go straight to it and, and, and do it. So we don't actually do the work of finding you one, but we're, we definitely cut out, because if you do search apartments in Lisbon, it's remarkably overwhelming. It's also very difficult for three months. You know, that's also a problem for remote workers. Finding that sort of short term, not maybe not a month, maybe three months, four months, that's a weird, that's a weird time period for apartment rentals uh, if you don't use Airbnb, which obviously has a lot of fees now. So that's what we're trying to do is find these, all these sources that we provide are ones that are suitable for people who are remote workers who are generally going to stay in a place in that one to say six months um, range. And that's by the end of my uh, travels when I did rent apartments, uh, I, I, I never used Airbnb because I found that w when you're researching from afar, uh, Airbnb is, I mean, the rates were often double or triple what I would pay if I just arrived at a destination pounded the pavement and found places through Facebook groups, uh, through rental agencies that, you know, you, you get a much better idea of what the actual cost of living is oh. by using those avenues. So those are the sort of avenues you use when you're researching and then uh, showing uh, oh. options to your viewers. Yes, exactly. I mean, Airbnb is easy, right? So in a lot of the places we do mention it because if people are coming for a month or less, it's in some places, it's the only way, like that's it. Nobody's going to rent you an apartment for three weeks. Simple as that. So we do put it in there for, for certain ones. But the idea is that, yes, exactly. There are other sources. 
But if you haven't done a lot of research, it's pretty hard to find those sources. Um, like you said, you know, normally have to arrive, talk to people. So this is kind of a way for people to have done all of that research before they arrive. So they don't have to wait until they get there and hit the pavement. They can actually find those sources in advance. And yeah, maybe line up to go see a few apartments when they arrive, but at least that's already taken care of. And then hopefully they go see a few and within a few days they can, they can have a, their place. And this is a great productivity tip as well, because if, if I can use Remote Club to find a place to stay, figure out the best neighborhood, uh, get a SIM card, plug into co-working and co-living spaces, and, and really that will allow me to be infinitely more productive at with my work, which, you know, we all work full time. And I think that it's important when you have a long-term travel lifestyle, it's important to recognize that you are still working full time. Wow. And it, it's a... The, the obligation for the amount of hours that you spend in front of your computer are rarely any less than they would be if you were in an office or, or working from home. Uh, so it's definitely time management becomes important. Mm -hmm. uh, now, something that you said a little bit earlier is you, you, one of your secrets to having lasted for 21 years is that you would occasionally stop and not only take stock of where you're headed in life, but also to rest uh, for a, a period of time, which is for me was I, necessary, entirely necessary. And I actually created some bases that were up to two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course I use them, you know, I traveled from those bases, but having that bit of grounding for a little while was definitely instrumental. I'm curious uh, to what some of your bases were and, and what amount of time you spent in them along the way. Sure. So I have returned to here to Playa del Carmen, Mexico several times over the years, just because it's quite convenient. Uh, also, I can easily pop back to the US and visit family and friends. Um, and I do, I am kind of a sucker for beach living. Um, so yeah, so I do, I have come here, I think three times over the years. Uh, and it's ranged from like six to 12 months with trips though. So I do take trips and come back, but having a place here for six to 12 months. Um, my most recent before this was Valencia, Spain. Um, I did, uh, I was over there for almost six months. Uh, Bucharest, Romania was actually my base for almost four years. I did come and go. Like, I don't think I ever actually spent more than two months in the country at a time, but it was my base that I would come and come you know, returned to for almost four years. Uh, that was a big one. Um, and I've done like the Chiang Mai thing. <laughs> Everybody has, it's a rite of passage. Yeah, Chiang Mai thing. yeah, I wouldn't be allowed to, you know, start a blog if I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> and Australia, honestly, I actually, I studied abroad in Australia way back when, and uh, I have friends in Melbourne, so I do go back there. So I have gone a couple times and done like four month stints in uh, Melbourne as to just kind of be around friends and, and chill you've now been remote working for 13 years. What would your uh, best advice be for productivity, work-life balance slash travel uh, tips? Totally. I think honestly, it's being realistic. And I think that's one of the issues is you have to just stop before the, the lifestyle sounds awesome and it is awesome, but it's probably not what you think. It's, you don't, you know, the fact of bouncing around and getting a job done or starting your own business, whatever you're doing online, they're generally not two things that mix very well in terms of productivity because you wake up, you wanna do things, it's beautiful weather, you wanna go for a walk, you're in a new place, you're fascinated, maybe you have jet lag, you wanna sleep in. Um, I mean, it's just never ending things that are not conducive to a solid work day. Um, so I think you have to take a, a very realistic approach and adjust your idea of the lifestyle accordingly, because otherwise you get burned out very quickly. And I find it's okay to, yeah, that's it. Go somewhere. You got to, you have a lot of work coming up, go somewhere, go to one place, say, I got to stay there for three, four months, do your work, do, obviously you're going to have fun as well. You're going to do things on the side, but it's okay to concentrate on work because without that, the lifestyle is going to end very quickly. So I think, you know, just being realistic and not feeling like you have to copy somebody else, because I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I got to go around the world. I got to keep bouncing around. To be perfectly honest, most remote workers and digital nomads do not constantly travel around. Most are literally bouncing around from Bali to Lisbon to Medellin to Playa del Carmen because A, there's a community in those places and B, that's just realistic because you need to be in one place more than you probably think in order to get your work done. And I think that's something to, it's probably a good idea to think about that ahead of time until, uh, 
not when it's too late and you're already in the midst of it getting burnt out and trying to try to juggle everything. I'm no stranger to burnout. I've done it a few times. And exactly. Well, one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of slow travel as well is because uh, of exactly what you were talking about. And it, it's, I remember as a, a way to illustrate my point, I was house sitting in Switzerland uh, and in a beautiful little spot. And I was introduced to the neighbors before the, the homeowners uh, went on their trip. It was a three month uh, house sitting gig. And about a week and a half into my stay, the neighbor knocked on the door and checked, oh, just checking in, how are you doing? And then, so what have you seen? And I was embarrassed uh, to say that I really hadn't seen a lot. I mean, they were shocked that I hadn't covered all of the sites in Zurich and made a day trip to Lucerne and done all these other things that I, I thought, it, I've been here for a week and a half. And this is the, the biggest and hardest thing for me to understand along the way is that, you know, if you think about it, let's say you're working from home, you've got a full time job, right? So you're working from nine to four, or whatever it is, you're, you're on the computer from nine to five. Uh, you've also got your your health and wellness routine, maybe you're exercising, you've got to cook your dinners, you got to go grocery shopping, how much time is left over at right. the end of that, the tasks of daily life are a lot. So day, from it, noon to four. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, so if, if you think about, you know, what your work lifestyle would be at home and, you know, you would have maybe two days a week, your weekends to go off and do things. So definitely to revise any expectations of conquering the world or conquering a destination uh, is, is definitely necessary. And it is the reason why I love slow travel as well, because then it gives me a chance to really explore and deepen my experience of a destination at a realistic pace. Exactly. And I really think that's the key. Everything is just, yeah. And if, I'm sure if people were to contact, you know, a lot of people who've been doing this, 10 people who've been doing this a long time, this is going to come up all the time because everybody's gone through it. Everybody thought they could handle it in a different way. Everybody realized that traveling full time, bouncing around and, and working is not, you know, not very feasible and everybody reaches this conclusion. So I think it doesn't sound as sexy. <laughs> obviously uh, go to what do you mean go to place for four months and sit there and what am I going to do and trust me like you said you'll have plenty to do because you're going to a work and b then you will be able to accomplish all the other stuff you want to do it just takes time now by the same token uh having followed your travels over the years I know that you have gone through some fairly lengthy stint, stint, stints of really fast travel. And I think even a couple of years ago, you had a full year of just going hard and heavy in, in the travel uh, sphere. So how did you manage your workload while traveling at that pace? Yeah, I mean, I think with that, it's possible. You just need to prepare. So I have, I think at least I have the experience now of, of finding what is realistic where I can change it up. So if I know, okay, I'm gonna go through a period of faster travel now, we're gonna see a lot of places in a shorter period of time, um, for whatever reason, I had that kind of block of time. Um, and I think it's just preparation. So in, in sticking, it's discipline, right? So there's certain stuff, I kind of narrowed it down to exactly what I need to do and when, and made sure I did that, that work. And anything bigger that I was trying to work on or achieve I made a plan so it would happen probably more slowly than it would if I was in one place, but so that it didn't take up as much time um, as if I was in one place. But that's the thing. It's like if I'm in one place, so I was in Mexico actually before that very fast period of time. So I knew ahead of time, okay, I'm going to start to do some traveling. So let me work on things and let me let me get some of these bigger things out of the way so that I'm going to be at a place where it's just sort of maintain and a little bit of extra work and, and I'll be able to handle that. And that's a great observation. I think there's a fine line between preparing and planning in that if you over plan a trip, you may find partway through that experience that you've overextended yourself or you're moving faster than you'd like to. And, you know, I remember when I was, uh, I was based in Peru for a, a couple of years and people would, I was living in the Sacred Valley, which of course attracts lots and lots of travelers and people would come through and they would fall in love with the area and they would say, oh my gosh, I wish I, I wish I'd allowed longer to stay here, but I got to go to Bolivia now because that's what the itinerary says I have to do. So there is that that line between uh, planning and having an idea of what you want to do, but not over planning, because one of the beauties of travel and the travel lifestyle is, is the impulsive and, and yeah. seeing what you find when you get there. So totally. it's the freedom. It's the freedom to say to not have to miss anything that you don't want. And, and basically, 
that's it. So like, even though I prepared, I prepared work-wise, but yes, almost didn't plan. So even though uh, my girlfriend and, and I, we basically went to maybe 60 countries in a very short period of time, a couple of years, but basically we didn't plan much, honestly, like in advance, very last minute for almost all of it. And it was pretty remarkable because we were able to adjust. If we wanted to spend more time somewhere, we were, we were able to. And if we needed to, for example, because obviously stuff you can't prepare for a year of work in advance, you know, obviously stuff comes up unexpected. So if that happens, we just make an adjustment and go somewhere where we can, okay, make sure we take care of it uh, or extend our stay wherever we are and then and then get back into it afterwards. So, so I, I want to digress now and I want to pick your brains about some of the adventures that you've had along the way and some of the different iterations of your travel lifestyle uh, along the way over the last 21 years. Uh, and one of the things that you are known for, and you wrote a book about this as well, is working on cruise ships. And I'm curious if you have any observations about that as a lifestyle. I will say just very quickly that uh, I, I'm a former professional actor, singer, dancer, and I always kind of had a... I always had a, a thing for, you know, I always kind of thought one day I would work on a cruise ship and I, I would perform. And I had a friend who worked on cruise ships and she said it was an excellent way to save money because when you're on the ship, of course, all your expenses are paid. So all the money uh, that you're earning really just goes into a bank account. Uh, but over to you, what was your experience like and do you have any recommendations? I honestly think uh, it, it's a pretty under underrated, underutilized uh, opportunity. Um, it's very similar reasons is that you have almost no expenses. So that's that's like the foundation right there. You have almost no expenses. And uh, that's pretty cool that you just get an income that goes into your bank account. That's a good, just a good foundation. But the other bonuses, the other aspects of it that people don't think about, A, networking. So first of all, I was on a ship all the time with 1,200 other crew members always changing as well as every week or two weeks you know 2,000 passengers if you use it wisely and you connect and talk to people pretty amazing I've had business opportunities weeks travel stays in different places I have friends all over the world now from that networking and I think that's a huge thing it's just so many people I mean all the different ships they have different clientele and I've met all kinds of people and it's that was incredible. The other thing is, honestly, I guess it depends a little bit on the job that you have, but it can be used for like education and skills. I wouldn't be running my tour company now if I wasn't a tour manager on cruise ships for four years. Simple as that. I learned about, I wasn't planning on running a tour company, but the stuff I learned from being a tour manager and having the opportunity to meet all these tour operators and all the ports of call and to deal with the head office of the cruise line who is in charge of all the excursions and and to have my team that I managed and to, you know, it was, it was actually quite, uh, you know, I think on most of the ships I had, I, we were, we were taking in the tour, the tour department was taking in like over a million dollars a week and to, to be responsible for that and to actually see how that worked was, I was only going back to school and without that knowledge, it would have been a totally different story when I started my, my tour company. So I think there are the, those other aspects. Honestly, I don't even, as you noticed, I haven't even put travel up there. Like that's, that's just like a total extra bonus. Like, yes, it's not travel, as people say. You're not traveling. You're having lunch in many different places or occasionally <laughs> going to the beach for a couple of hours. But at the same time, I'm always like, sure, it's not traveling, but I'm, I'm not going to complain about having lunch in Dubrovnik one day and then lunch in Athens the next day and then lunch in Italy the next day. I mean, I'll take that as, a, as an alternative. Um, Obviously, it depends on the position, um, many different positions. Not all of them have the same privileges, that's for sure, on the ship. So there's, there's definitely a whole hierarchy system, and it's, it's definitely different for everybody. But from my personal experience, it was very beneficial. And uh, yeah, I credit it with a lot of the connections and, and skills that I, that, I, that I use these days. My understanding is regardless of the position on the ship, it is very labor intensive. So I, I would imagine it would be impossible to, for example, run a blog on the side at the same time. Yeah, that wouldn't be possible. Uh, that would be pretty difficult. I mean, it's labor intensive, but it's the whole lifestyle is intertwined. So it's fascinating because it's not like you have eight hours on and then you come back the next day. It's like all broken into chunks for most departments. And then you have a little bit of time off, a little bit off, you can go off the ship, come back on. So it's, it's sort of, I don't look at it as a, a work and play balance. It's just, it's just ship life, what they call it. It's just ship life. It's all mixed together and uh, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. But if you don't mind it, the lifestyle and the mix, then it's, it can be quite, uh, quite an interesting, uh, 
quite an interesting ride. Well, and now that you mention it, I feel like ship life was actually good training for being a travel content creator, where again, the, the lines are blurred between work and play all of the time. And, you know, depending on how you delineate, you know, what you call work, you could be working <laughs> every waking hour, because if travel is part is considered work, well, that, guess what? You're always on the clock. Yeah, exactly. Oh, totally. A hundred percent. I mean, it's a good, uh, and I think that's happening with a lot of things these days, right? Is the kind of the lines are just being blurred. And especially as people are working online and, and getting out there as remote workers, it's kind of, it's a lot of people starting businesses that have to do with travel or have to do with being in other places. And I think it is getting, uh, it's pretty interesting to see that. Uh, I mean, I know people here who literally all their free time is actually doing stuff that is 100% for their business. It's amazing stuff. Like literally it's basically, it's doing incredible stuff. And it's from people who, if they were just doing it on their own, they would be like, this is amazing, but it's actually 100% for a business. So I mean, that's an interesting lesson to learn, but I think, you know, it's not for everybody. Like just like remote work is not for everybody, but um, if it is, there's benefits. You alluded to your tour company and how uh, working as a tour manager on cruise ships was definitely on the job training for your tour company. Uh, please talk to me a little bit about what you offer in terms of your tours. Sure. So pretty much, uh, yeah, I just started with a, a tour to India in uh, 2013 when a bunch of my blog readers just asked if they could travel to India with me. And that kind of something just snapped in my head at that moment. I was like, wow, that's several people asked if they could travel to India. So let me put together a tour based on my personal experiences. It's just, it's not going to be a regular tour. It's literally how, what I would do if I went on my own and it started with that one trip and yeah, it just, the idea caught on. So had to, like, 2019, I had about 18 tours to about 12 different countries. Last year, I would have had about 25, but uh, obviously COVID, I ran one tour. Um, but uh, yeah, so and this year I, I have a bunch at the end of the year. So the idea is that there's unique small group tours that are totally locally focused. Um, and they're all itineraries that are based on my personal experiences. So there's a ton of local interaction going to villages um, of my friends, um, doing activities that are way off the beaten path that only people who live in a certain area would know about and where tourists generally don't go. Obviously we see a lot of the main stuff too, cause that's what you do, but, um, and that's cool, but we do it all in a unique way. And um, yeah, I like to just think about that. It. It's not a typical group tour at all. It's pretty much like traveling with a bunch of friends. They're very flexible trips, which I love this part. Like I really work hard to keep them flexible where if we're driving down the road and suddenly you see a, a wedding in a village in India, we can stop. We don't have a strict schedule. Like I will be more happy to rearrange everything so that we can have any experience that comes our way and not have to just be, oh, we can't do this because we have to stick to the schedule. So they're very flexible so that we can take advantage of anything that comes our way, just like you would want to do if you were traveling on your own. And that's kind of the, the core of, of it. And um, yeah, it's been pretty cool. And now I run, I think I've run tours to maybe 20 different countries at this point. And um, yeah, all kinds of niche private tours and tours for my blog audience and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I love it. I love it. I want to ask you one more question about your travel experience, uh, and it is that you were in a Bollywood movie. Now, I, I have been to India, but in the years prior to going to India, I had always said, I have these kind of travel stunts. I like to the, the, give myself these little challenges. So my challenge for India was always that I was going to see how long it would take me to land in the country and, uh, and then find my way on the set to the set of a Bollywood movie. I wanted to see how long it could take me to hack my way into Bollywood. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. not how my Indian trip ended up going, but you did manage to hack your way into Bollywood and I want to know more. Yep. Um, so I ended up doing it I was at a, I was at a hotel, I was in, in Mumbai and I was basically waiting for my friend to come and I was about to go to the airport to pick her up at the airport. And just before I left, I realized that, uh, it was the wrong day. So I sat back down. I was like, huh? And the receptionist at the hotel just came over to me and he was like, what are you doing? I was like, he's like, what are you doing today? I was like, nothing. And he was, he said, you want to act in a Bollywood film? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. If you want to do it, I'll set it up. They'll pay you and everything. I was just like, whatever. Okay. So he went, made a phone call. And sure enough, 30 minutes later, somebody picked me up and we went out to an area called Juhu beach, which is wealthy area on the, uh, on the beach, uh, obviously. And, um, to this mansion and that was turned into a set. I don't know what happened. Next thing I know, uh, the director made me go down the street and get a shave. 
um, and a haircut. And then I came back, they gave me a police uniform and I played a British police officer along with a French guy that they had found somewhere else. And he was the other British police officer. Um, but he didn't speak any, really any English. So I got all the lines <laughs> and wow. Uh, so you got lines as well. Oh yeah. I had lines. Oh, it was great. Yeah. I had to inform this family that unfortunately their daughter was in a car accident and I had her wallet and her sweater and her keys. And then I had to, uh, the grandmother overhears me behind and she collapses and I had to do a, <gasps> yeah, pretty good. Right. Uh, <laughs> So it was pretty funny. Uh, I was there the whole day. Everybody was super nice. The actors, the actresses. Um, it took place, we were supposedly in London. Um, everybody was super nice. They had food there. I did get paid. I mean, it was crazy. I got paid like 20 bucks, but that was, I was like, all right, that's cool. And um, it was just a super, super fun day. And yeah, it took quite a few attempts for me to get the lines right. I was definitely super nervous, shaking, and it was coming out all. I couldn't even say like the word sweater, but eventually well, it worked. Not only that though, you had to go from a Boston accent to a British accent. That must they have been challenging. Care. They didn't even care about the accent. <laughs> they didn't even care. I think it was a low budget film, but they didn't, yeah, they were just like, whatever. Like they just, I said, I was like, am I supposed to put on a British accent? Like just, just speak normal. I was like, okay. But to be honest, I've learned after that, it's so easy in, in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Like there's the one neighborhood, you go to this neighborhood, Kolaba district in South Mumbai. Just kind of hang around if you're a foreign and you hang around on the street corner after i did that one that like my friend arrived and two days later we were walking around this area and somebody asked us if we wanted to act in a indian uh, pepsi commercial but it was a two it was i think it was a two-week gig so we said no because we had plans to go elsewhere but uh yeah i mean it's like you just walk around they're just like, grabbing you off the street my aspirations were always to uh get a part doing dancing I want it. I definitely wanted a dance scene. Yeah. So per perhaps I need to uh, spend a little time. That was the Pepsi commercial. The Pepsi commercial was dancing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Background dancers. That was another. Okay. That might've also been a reason why I said no, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brilliant. Try it again. Try it again. All right. Definitely. That's, it's on my list. I have, I have an ever growing post pandemic list of places I want to travel yeah, right. and things I yeah. want to do around the world. Yeah. Cool. And one of my inspirations for travel continues to be your weekly newsletter. I absolutely adore it. Uh, it you, you always do a little personal update as to what you're doing uh, and, and how your cat is. Matcha hasn't actually shown up, which is amazing. You adopted a cat in Bali. Amazing. Yeah, it is wow. amazing at this time. Yeah. Uh, but you also share uh, amazing articles from around the web uh, and you have a very engaged readership. So I know they're regularly sending you interesting videos and links uh, and whatnot. And it's also a great place to learn about your tours. Uh, mm -hmm. So where and how can people subscribe to your newsletter? Sure. So right on um, wanderingearl.com, you'll see the subscription right there. Um, and yeah, I, like you said, it's a weekly newsletter. I, I appreciate the kind words. It's definitely something that I love love creating. So uh, it's good to, good to get that feedback. But yeah, right on wanderingearl.com, you can sign up. It takes two seconds. And uh, yeah, once a week, every Tuesday. And what is the address of Remote Club? Uh, so Remote Club is remoteclub.com. And um, yeah, straight up. And um, yeah, it's all there. We have about 30 different destinations that you can uh, look at. We have all the information up there. We have like people have asked questions about them. So we've answered uh, all kinds of questions about that, about each destination. You can compare cities as well. Um, yeah, lots of cool, cool features on there. Well, you are nothing if not a leading example with 21 years of full-time travel under your belt. And I don't think that you're going to stop anytime soon. Uh, and I, I hope you don't because you are a thought leader in the space and you, I believe, are going to be able to herald a whole new uh, generation uh, of remote workers and help them to be able to adopt a long-term travel lifestyle. So I'm very grateful that you have spent the last 40 minutes with me. And uh, thank you, Derek. Oh, I appreciate it as well. It was wonderful to talk to you, of course. I'm Nora Dunn, otherwise known as the Professional Hobo, and I'll catch you next time.